All energy and esteem be to the Most High Elohim. This is your brother L. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 7. In these times that we live in right now, it's a lot of what I like to call fake Negro outrage that's going on. You got a lot of people that their energy is outrage. Their energy is hopelessness. What we need to grasp and never forget is the fact that there's people, there's spirits, there's groups out there that feed off of outrage and hopelessness. And it goes both ways. There's people who enjoy being outraged about any and everything at any given time. And there's people that enjoy being hopeless. On the other side of that same hundred dollar bill, there's other groups and spirits and people who enjoy making people outraged and making people feel hopeless. So in these times that we live in, you got two different groups of people. One group of people enjoys being hopeless and being outraged about things that happen, things happening in world news, things happening locally, things happening in their personal life. They enjoy that pain and that hopelessness and being outraged about things not going their way. They enjoy being the victim. They get actually turned on by being victimized. They love taking L's. They love being defeated. They love being oppressed. They love being depressed. They love always being on the losing end of the spectrum. They've got to the point where they feed off their own outrage and they feed off their own hopelessness. They love being the last of the last and the bottom of the bottom and they wouldn't have it no other way and they'll actually get upset with you if you try to reach out a helping hand or give them information that would lift them up from the bottom to the top, they will make you their enemy for even trying to get them out of victimhood. Would you look at that? That's one group. And another group of folk we got in these days is folk who like to inflict pain upon others to make them outraged and to make them hopeless. And they enjoy seeing people outraged. They enjoy seeing people hopeless and they feed off that. Those are the type of individuals we got in this world right now. People who feed off of outrage and hopelessness all throughout your uh, news feed. For those of you that's into the social media, I'm not. But for those who are, when you look at your timeline, nine times out of 10, especially amongst our people, What you're going to see on that timeline is situations, news and events that is doing nothing more but to make people outraged and to make people feel hopeless. All the things that are are occurring ain't doing nothing but making folks say, man, it's bad out here. Dang, man. Another person got killed by the police. Dang, man. Another child got raped. Dang, man. Them heathens, they another one dressed in blackface. Dang, man. They still ain't uh indicted Trump. Dang, man. All it is is just a timeline full of outrage and hopelessness. All it is is a bunch of Negroes posting stuff on the news feed about defeat, losses, pain. I'm not saying this is the case with everybody, news feed or timeline. I'm saying nine times out of ten. There's others that are out there that are wise enough not to inundate themselves with that constant bad news of the enemy winning. They don't inundate their mind and their spirit with images and visuals and news of the enemy getting W's over our people. They spending their time meditating in the laws and commands. They spending their time meditating on their victory and good success in their life so that they will be able to to show forth the excellence of the most high through them and the decisions they make. Yet at the same time, what's going on is outrage, hopelessness, people feeding on all the latest news that'll get them pumped up, hyped up, angry, that'll get them in a place feeling hopeless. Even so to the point, constantly looking at all that bad news can even make some folks start to doubt the most high. They'll see all this bad news, whether it be from uh, other people's personal life, 
their own personal life or just the news, just period. They'll begin to get in a place where they say, man, it seemed like the stuff the most high was talking about would happen ain't happening. All I'm seeing is my people taking L's, taking losses. And one or two things will happen. They will become that type of person that takes aggressive action to bring a solution to situations or they'll become those people who begin to feed off that outrage and hopelessness to the point where all they want is a steady diet of bad news. All they want is a steady diet of disappointment. All they want is a steady diet of pain. They begin to feed off of outrage and hopelessness. And guess what the enemy is doing that whole time while Negroes is sitting around outraged and hopeless. They're going to keep doing the same thing they've been doing. Matter of fact, they're going to ramp it up. They're going to double down. They're going to triple down. When they see that Negroes is becoming outraged and hopeless, they're going to start doing even more to make you even more outraged and hopeless because your outrage and hopelessness feeds them. Ain't that something? How about it? The outrage and hopelessness of Negroes feeds the oppressor. Yet, Let's not get it mistaken. Whenever we do see oppression out in the world, it does cause us to have righteous anger. Let's talk about that. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 7, it says, surely oppression maketh the wise man mad. Let me run it back. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad. Granted, whenever we see the oppression ch- taking place, if we be righteous, Indeed, it will make us mad. Indeed, it will make us feel a certain type of way. Indeed, it will make righteous anger swell up within us. If you see some of the things taking place today. If you call yourself a child of the most high and some of this nonsense like them teaching pedophilia in schools. If some of this nonsense of the transgender agenda and the effeminizing of the black male, if that don't make you righteously angry. You might have to double check and triple check if you even got the spirit of truth at all. Now, some people may be saying, well, brother L, ain't you contradicting yourself? First, you saying that they feed off our outrage and hopelessness. Then you saying in certain cases, it's righteous that we become angry. That's exactly what I'm saying. And it's not a contradiction because I'm going to break it down. It all is contingent upon the fact of what we do with that righteous anger after we feel it. Do you channel it to solutions? Do you channel it to praying for your uh, adversary to fall? Or do you just sit there feeding off your own outrage and hopelessness until the next event happens that will give you your next high and your next uh, smoke of outrage and hopelessness? It's contingent upon how we respond to it. That's the point that I'm here to make today. So again, surely oppression makes a wise man mad. But we have to be chess players in these days and times to know how to uh, righteously distribute that anger into solutions. Hallelujah. It's a balance with this because let's shoot over two verses up. To Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. Listen to what it says. It says. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So what that is telling us is that. There's a righteous anger. And then there's an anger that will cause you to make a fool of yourself. And sadly. Eight to nine times out of ten. Many of our people are falling victim to the latter. They are becoming those who, whenever they get that outrage and that hopelessness from seeing all the nonsense going on in their life and in the world, they let that anger make make fools of themselves. I'm here to say, let's not do that. Let's channel that righteous anger into solutions. Let's be chess players about this. Hallelujah. Listen to this verse again. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. If we took heed to that scripture right there, then a lot of these individuals, entities, spirits, heathens, whatever you want to call it, they wouldn't be able to feed off our outrage and our hopelessness 
because we wouldn't be hasty in our spirit. Not saying that we do not get righteously angry because it is a time to be righteously angry and righteous anger is a beautiful thing. It's a powerful energy. If you know how to righteously distribute it, don't let nobody ever make you feel a way about being righteously angry. But yes, you do need to feel a way if you are letting that outrage and hopelessness take you to a place where now you're starting to make foolish decisions. I'll give you a couple of examples. You got brothers out here that deal with a lot of drama with the heathens on the job and whatnot. Instead of taking it up with them heathens on the job, that's talking to them a certain way, treating them a certain way. Instead, they take that anger, bring it back home. Now they talking down to their children, whooping up on their children unrighteously, talking down to their wife, beating on their wife unrighteously. And they misplacing the anger and the outrage that they've been getting from them heathens on that job. And now, since they was too cowardly to take it to the face of the heathens on the job, now they bringing it back home to their family and trying to lord over the family in an unrighteous way to spend all that outrage on somebody who didn't have nothing to do with why you mad in the first place. How about that? You got so many situations where... Negroes will see the stuff going on in the world with what the enemy is doing, be it the police killings, be it all these news stories that they like to inundate folks with about our children getting mistreated in the school system or, you know, heathens jumping and beating up and assaulting some of our women, our people. Well, whatever story that you want to come up with, y'all know the type stories I'm talking about, the ones that they put out there to get Negroes pumped up, hyped up. Uh, feeling outraged, feeling hopeless, feeling all oppressed and downtrodden, those stories. You got Negroes that whenever they hear those stories, instead of taking that righteous anger and turning it into solutions like hitting that gym and working out, like hitting that shooting range and getting your shot on point, taking your wife and even some of your young ones when they get of age, taking them to the shooting range to get that sniper ship on point. Instead of taking that anger of what you see going on in the world and flipping that into you becoming an entrepreneur and an owner and opening up multiple streams of income so you don't got to work for the heathens instead of using the anger for that reason. Instead, what they'll do is try to go fight their brother. You got Negroes that they mad about what they seeing the heathen do out in the world, but instead of taking that righteous anger and flipping the energy into something that will benefit them and their generations and generations and their children's children. What they will do instead is turn the anger right back around on their own people. Those, the Negroes that you see constantly arguing and debating online. Those, the Negroes that you see that they make it their life daily goal to get in an argument or fight with somebody that looks just like them. Those are the type of Negroes that make fools of themselves because anger rests in their bosom. But those who are wise take that righteous anger and they turn it into ownership. They turn it into solutions. They turn it into uh, assets and information that will position themselves and their families to be winners in now and in the time to come. That's what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Let us never be like those who become fools because of our anger. Let us be like those who, number one, whenever we feel that righteous anger, number one, we take action, physical action. And number two, if we can't take action against the people, the spirit or whatever that's bringing us the oppression, that's making us outrage, then the next thing we need to do is speak curses on them. Let me give you an example of how the Messiah handled whenever he had outrage and whenever he had righteous anger. Two things he did. Number one, he either took physical action or number two, he would curse those or whatever entity that was not bringing forth the fruit that needed to be brought forth. Hallelujah. Let's go to John chapter two, verse 13 through 16. Here's what it says. It says, and the Jews Passover was at hand. And the Messiah went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. How about that? 
So the Messiah, whenever he saw them thieves in there in the temple, trying to hustle and bustle and flex muscle, what did he do? He ain't pray for him. What did he do? He didn't have no town hall meetings trying to figure out how can we all get along. He ain't trying to call them allies and we all in this together. No, he tied together a cord, a sharp cord at that. So sharp that it became a scourge and he beat their behinds up out of that temple. It wasn't no uh, uh, ally coalition. It wasn't no, uh, you know, we all in this together. Let's just love. Nah, he beat him up out of that temple. So he channeled his righteous anger into physical action. Would you look at that? And it wasn't just any type of physical action of just some Negro, you know, going off on a rant. No, he targeted his anger to a specific group of people that right at that moment was doing wrong. And he checked them on code right at that moment. He ain't wait till later. He ain't try to take that anger out on nobody else that ain't have nothing to do with it. He checked those who was involved right then and there. He read them the Miranda rights. He read them the riot act right there in the temple. Did not wait on sight. The Messiah wasn't one that's going to let somebody feed off his outrage and hopelessness. No, he going to deal with the situation right then and there. Let me read this again because we got to get this ingrained in us. It says, and the Jews Passover was at hand and the Messiah went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes money and overthrew the tables. So the Messiah got physical with it. That lets you know there is a time for physical violence. There is a time for physical moves and maneuvers that you got to make to let folk know it's not a game, never been a game and not going to be a game because the Messiah did it. How about that? So there's no going against that. There's no denying that. I'm not reading out of no uh, different version of the scripture right there in the KJV. John chapter two, verse 13 through 16. The Messiah got physical when it came to distributing his righteous anger. And listen to what he said. It says, and he said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So that's one solution that we have right there. What we need to do whenever we feel that outrage, instead of sitting there being outraged and hopeless and letting the enemy feed off our outrage and hopelessness, turn that righteous anger into righteous action. Hallelujah. Because that's what the Messiah did. Now, let's examine this from another angle. There's some situations where, you know, physical violence or doing something physically isn't the answer. And instead, what needs to be done is for righteous curses to be sent out against that enemy or against that adversary. Let me give you an example here. Let's go to uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through 14, verse 20 and 21. And then I'm going to give you some other scriptures from the book of Acts. Here's what it says in Mark. It says, and on the morrow, when they were come home from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Yeshua answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. So the Messiah cursed that tree for not bearing no fruit. And his disciples heard it. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. Hallelujah. Right there, it lets us know that there is a time to righteously curse something or somebody. Let's go to the book of Acts and find out how the apostles also sent out curses to adversaries. I'm going through this. Because I'm trying to take our people out of that spirit of outrage and hopelessness. I'm showing you that instead of letting these folk feed off your outrage and hopelessness, turn that righteous anger either into physical action where you do something to where they will feel it and know that you're not playing in a righteous way, I might add. 
I have to emphasize righteous because some Negroes will go off to the left with this and not be in the spirit of the most high. Then there are other times where curses need to be sent out in a righteous manner at the target that is perpetuating this injustice, this oppression or this wickedness. Hallelujah. Now let's go to the book of Acts real quick. Let's go to Acts chapter 13, starting at verse six. Here's what it says. And when they are going through the aisle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of the Most High. But Elimus the sorcerer withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now listen to what Paul did. Let's see if Paul prayed for this brother. Let's see if Paul tried to have brunch with him and sit and talk about their differences and agree to disagree and all that other nonsense that they teaching you to do to these heathens and these wicked folks. Verse nine, then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Most High? And now behold, the hand of the Most High is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. How about it? So Paul did not pray for that man. He cursed that man to go blind. Would you look at that? Yet you got Negroes that instead of sending out righteous curses to an adversary that is against the most high, against the most high's people and against the kingdom, they will sit there in their outrage and in their hopelessness. And all that does is make the enemy just oppress you even more. Why? Because they feed off your outrage and they feed off your hopelessness. Okay. Let me give you a couple more examples of this mentality that these folks have who feed off outrage and feed off hopelessness. Let's go to Exodus chapter five, verse one through 18. I'm going to show you this. And after I'm done, you're going to see how this spirit is at work today and who it is at work through. And after I get done with this, I pray that you will be the type of individual that when you see this occur, either you will take righteous physical action or you will send out curses against that adversary. Listen to what it says here in Exodus chapter five. It says, and afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Elohim of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the most high that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the most high, neither will I let Israel go. Look at that. That's the same response they give our people whenever Negroes doing all this marching and protesting, talking about send letters to your congressman, talking about uh, pray for the government, all this other just dumb, cowardly Negro nonsense that they've been teaching us that it's time for us to say, hell no, that's not going to be the response because it didn't work with Pharaoh, did it? Whenever Moses and Aaron came asking, being kind, being respectful, whenever they came asking to have their own, Pharaoh didn't give it to them. But here we're going to see that all it made Pharaoh do was feed off the outrage and hopelessness even more. Listen, it says, and they said, the Elohim of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Most High our Elohim, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their work get you unto your burdens? Look at that. So whenever they came talking about we Hebrews, it's time for us to be free. We the true chosen people of the Most High. Y'all wrong for how y'all doing us. Did it make Pharaoh say, you know what? I'm sorry for enslaving y'all this 400 years. How, how rude of me to do that. I sincerely apologize, y'all. Yeah, go ahead, man. It's all good. Matter of fact, here, take $5 trillion for reparations with you while you out. Matter of fact, we'll throw you a party while you leave Egypt where we've had you enslaved for four, 400 years. Did Pharaoh say that? Nah. 
But instead, all it did was make him mock and scoff and laugh at those he was already oppressing. Why? Because he has that same spirit that's on these folks today where they feed off of outrage and they feed off of hopelessness. The only thing that's going to stop these folks is bloodshed and curses. That is it. You are not going to love your way out of this oppression. The only thing that will stop this monster is bloodshed and curses. That is it. Do you hear me? Listen, it says, and the king of Egypt said unto them, wherefore do ye Moses and Aaron let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. See, this is the same spirit that's on these folks. You got Negroes getting all outraged about these clothing companies that put out these racist imagery on the clothing. They mad at Katy Perry for the blackface shoes. They mad at Gucci for the turtleneck with the blackface. They was mad at H&M for having the uh, little Hebrew boy posing as a monkey. They get mad at all that. But have you noticed that ever since that has happened, all they've done is do it even more. Once they saw Negroes was outraged and started getting in that hopelessness spirit, what did they do? They doubled down. They ramped it up. They put out even more clothes of people in blackface. Then they put out even more stories of politicians dressing in blackface and all that. When they saw Negroes was outraged, all they did was double down, triple down and said, OK, they mad. We about to make them even more mad. Tell me I'm lying right now. Why? Because they feed off outrage and hopelessness. But. I'm going to show you how we get the solution to that. In fact, I've already told you either take physical direct action or send out curses. That's it. That's the solution. Listen, but let, 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 let's continue further on here. Check this out. It says, and Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land now are many and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day, the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore, let them go and gather straw for themselves. And the tale of bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them. Ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our Elohim. Let there be more work laid upon the men that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. Mm. So all that talk of y'all wrong, y'all oppressing us, y'all should stop. We the chosen people of the most high. This ain't right. I'm outraged. I, I'm, this has me feeling hopeless. This is so much trauma. This is so much pain. All that did was make Pharaoh double down on the oppression. And guess what? That's all it's going to make them do today. Whenever they see you outraged and hopeless, they're going to double down and triple down on the oppression. Let's go to first Kings chapter 13. I mean, first Kings chapter 12, verse three through 14. And I'm going to show you this same spirit at work again of when people in leadership oppressors see that you are hopeless and outraged. All they're going to do is double down and triple down on oppressing you to make you even more outraged and hopeless. And the only reason they do that is because they, they, they figure you're not going to take no physical action and they figure you're not going to send out no curses. And even if you did, they figure you don't got the spiritual power of the most high to where them curses that you send out will have impact. But we're going we to bring solutions here. But listen to this. First Kings 12, it says. They sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. So basically, the people was coming to the king saying, man, you've been oppressing us. Your daddy did us wrong. Uh, you know, your, your, your father was out here treating us bad. He wasn't treating us with equality. He wasn't showing us no love. So they was coming to the king expecting to somehow get the oppression lifted. 
They was coming to an oppressor asking for the oppressor not to do what an oppressor does. How ignorant is that? Let's see what the outcome is, even though y'all know good and hell well what the outcome's going to be. Let's keep reading. It says, thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived and said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, if thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day and wilt serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then will they be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he said unto them, what counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. Listen to this. So they came asking for help. And all he did was triple down on the oppression. He said, I will add to your yoke. My father have chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Man, the disrespect is on level 1000. But that's what happens whenever you go to an oppressor asking them kindly not to oppress you. All they're going to do is triple down on the oppression. Why? Because an oppressor feeds off of outrage and hopelessness. When they see you outraged and hopeless, all they're going to do is do even more to make you even more outraged and hopeless. Do you not see the jig? Do you not see the setup yet? So again, the only solution is to confront them with direct physical action, direct physical righteous violence, or if that's not the wisdom in order for that situation, then send out curses. Hallelujah. Let's go to Ecclesiasticus chapter 36, verse one through 11. And I'm going to show you the prayer to pray against wicked leadership, the curses to send out against wicked leadership. This is for those who aren't comfortable in certain situations to take physical action like the Messiah did whenever he went in there and flipped over them tables. This is for the prayer warriors and those who have the spirit of verbal assault. Like Paul, whenever he cursed the sorcerer, this is for y'all to give y'all empowerment. Hallelujah. Listen to this prayer of curses against wicked leaders in Ecclesiasticus chapter 36, starting at verse one. It says, have mercy upon us, Elohim of all and look upon us and cast fear of you upon all the heathen. Raise your hand against alien peoples and let them see your might. As you have been sanctified before them in us, may you be magnified before us in them and let them know as we have known that there is no Elohim, but you show signs again and show other wonders. Make your hand and your right arm glorious, arouse your anger and pour out your wrath. Would you look at this? He's not praying for these folks. Nothing good. He's praying destruction, bloodshed and wrath on these oppressors. Hallelujah. He says, arouse your anger and pour out your wrath. Destroy the adversary and wipe out the enemy. Let me read it again. Verse seven, destroy the adversary and wipe out the enemy. See all these folks doing the blackface, all these wicked judges, letting cops go free for killing our people unrighteously. All these folks uh, the CEOs of these fashion companies that mock us through the clothing. Don't pray for these folks. Pray curses on these folks. Hallelujah. That's what the scripture is saying. Listen, make your hand and your right arm glorious. Arouse your anger and pour out your wrath. Destroy the adversary and wipe out the enemy. Hasten the time and remember your oath and let them relate your mighty acts. Let him that would save himself be consumed in furious fire. Listen to this. I love this verse. 
verse 10, and let those who harm your people meet destruction. All praise to the most high. Verse 10, let all those who harm your people meet destruction. That's the prayer you pray against these folks. Not that Christian nonsense that you being taught to pray for these folks that's running in churches, killing women and children. You don't pray for them. Most of these folks ain't even asking for forgiveness. Are you serious? This is the prayer I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, Father, let those who harm your people meet destruction. That's what I'm going to pray. Pray what you want to pray, but I'm going to pray curses on them. It says, crush the heads of the enemy's rulers who say there is no one but ourselves. Gather all the tribes of Jacob and give them their inheritance as it was of old. Hallelujah. So that's what you do. Those of you who understand that there are certain situations where you don't take physical direct violence like the Messiah did when he went in there whipping folks and flipping tables over. Some of you may not be cut from that cloth. So here's what you can do. Go in your prayer closet and pray curses on them folks. That's what you do. Hallelujah. Hey, I just got done reading the scripture that said do that. Did I not? Go check it out for yourself. So, you know, I'm not making it up right there in the Apocrypha. All those other verses I gave you about Paul cursing the sorcerer, the Messiah cursing the fig tree, all right there in your King James Version Bible. That's not the Brother L version of the Bible. Go check it out if you're timid. Go check it out if you're scared. See if I'm lying or see if I'm telling the truth. Hallelujah. So you got all these folks in outrage and hopelessness, but they don't channel it into direct righteous violence or praying curses on the enemy. They just let themselves sit there in outrage and hopelessness to the point where they shrivel up and become so scared, not the fear of the most high. They don't become scared of the most high. They become more scared of the enemy and the heathen than they become scared of the most high. An example I'll give you with these police killings. You got a lot of Negroes that spend so much time meditating on all our brothers and sisters that's being killed by the police. It is definitely an amount that is too much. Yet, here's what I want you to understand. They feed off outrage and they feed off hopelessness. That empowers some of these race soldiers, some of these white inferiority police officers, and even some of these coon, jack leg, uh, so-called Hebrews that's in these police forces that ain't nothing but uh, a, a white man with dark skin. That's all many of them are behind the badge. All that does is empower them whenever they see the outrage and the hopelessness. All, all that looks like is a, a deer to a hunter. That's all that looks like whenever they see that fear. Instead of meditating on all these stories like, man, they done shot my boy 500 times and then they declared the cop not guilty. All these stories that Negroes like to meditate on that makes them fester in outrage and hopelessness. We are not to ignore these things taking place, but imagine if you meditated more on the scriptures that empower you to have power over the wicked police than focus on all these stories of Negroes getting shot down because all that's going to do is put you in a victimhood mentality. Let's go through some stories in the scripture of how the righteous men of the Most High got victory over wicked police officers. Let's run through these stories real quick so we can take you out of outrage and hopelessness and put you in a spirit of action and put you in a spirit to break curses against the wicked with police badges on. Second Kings chapter nine, verse nine through 12. Let's see how the prophet Elijah handled some wicked officers coming to arrest him. Listen to what it says. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to Elijah and behold, he sat on top of a hill and he spake unto him. Thou man of the most high, the king hath said, come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of the most high, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So that's 50 dead, wicked officers right there. 
Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of the Most High, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of the Most High, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. That's another 50 dead wicked officers and the fire of the most high came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 brothers and sisters. There's going to come a day where they will have police officers trying to force people to get microchipped. There's going to come a day where they will have people in badges trying to force the righteous to betray and go against the most high. As the Messiah said, they shall deliver you up to be killed, to be arrested to be thrown in prison. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, but be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. So understand the day will come and some would say it's already here because we see so many wicked police officers, what they do to our people. But I'm trying to get you out of that victimhood and get you out of your outrage and your hopelessness and get you in a mentality like the prophet Elijah had. Whenever that day comes, and Jacob's trouble intensifies. Don't be running out here scared and no police because you see the power that the Most High put on Elijah and you see what happened to them police that came to arrest Elijah. Do you not know you are the people of the Most High and he will visit you with that same power again? And that's why they scared. They need to be the ones scared of you, not you scared of them. Let's go to Exodus chapter two, verse 11 through 12. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Mm. I guess that was Moses' uh, outlook on how to handle pr- police brutality, wasn't it? Let's go to First Maccabees chapter 2 verses 15 through 26. And let's see how old man Maccabees uh, dealt with unrighteous situations dealing with officers. It says, then the king's officers who were forcing the people to give up their religion came to the town of Modin to make them offer sacrifice. So here in these days, you had actual officers that was trying to force the people to worship other gods. And don't you think for one moment that that's not going to happen again because it will. And that day is coming. So I'm trying to get this mentality and this spirit inside of you before that day comes. So you don't end up bowing down to no police officer who trying to tell you to betray the most high, your Elohim. Listen, and many Israelites went to them and Mattathias and his sons gathered together. Then the king's messengers answered and said to Mattathias, you are a leading man, great and distinguished in this town, surrounded with sons and brothers. Now be the first to come forward and carry out the king's command as all the heathen and the men of Judah and those who are left in Jerusalem have done. And you and your sons will be counted among the friends of the king and you and your sons will be distinguished with presents of silver and gold and many royal commissions. Then Mattathias answered, let's see. Let's see what Mattathias did. Let's see if he prayed with him. Let's see if he prayed for him. Let's see if he said, Jesus loves you. Can't we all get along? Let's see if he did that. It says, verse 19, then Mattathias answered and said in a loud voice, if all the heathen in the king's dominions listen to him and forsake each of them, the religion of his forefathers and and choose to follow his commands, and choose to follow his commands instead. Yet I and my sons and my brothers will live in accordance with the agreement of our forefathers. The most high forbid that we should abandon the law and the ordinances. We will not listen to the message of the king or depart from our religion to the right hand or to the left. So Mattathias didn't sit there in no fake Negro outrage, sitting there hopeless, sitting there saying, man, the heathen is oppressing me. The heathen is ruling over me. Nah, that was not his mentality. He wasn't cut from that cloth. Instead, let's see what happened next. Verse 23. And as he ceased to utter these words, a Jew went up before the eyes of all of them to offer sacrifice as the king commanded on the altar in Modin. And Mattathias saw him and was filled with zeal and his heart was stirred and he was very properly roused to anger and ran up and slaughtered him upon the altar. 
And at the same time, he killed the king's officer who was trying to compel them to sacrifice and he tore down the altar. Ain't that something? So this brother killed the other wicked Hebrew that was worshiping the false God, killed the police officer and then tore down the altar to the false God. Would you look at that? Ain't that something? Now, so much for uh, police inflicting oppression on the people, huh? Let's go to John chapter 18, verse three through six, and let's see the power that the Messiah came with whenever the officers ran up on him. Listen to this very carefully. John 18, it says, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. And Yeshua, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Yeshua of Nazareth. And Yeshua saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Brothers and sisters, imagine this for a moment. It's two, three, four in the morning. The Messiah and the disciples is out in the garden praying. The police run up about 50, 100 deep squad cars, DEA, FBI, CIA, run up on the Messiah and the disciples. All the rest of them cowards run away. The Messiah stands right there like who y'all looking for? I am he. And he said it with such power that all 100 of them police officers fell to the ground. Hallelujah. So the Messiah did not fear no wicked police. The prophets did not fear no wicked police. The Maccabee boys did not fear no wicked police. They had the power of the Most High with them, whether it was through direct physical violence or if it was through curses and verbal annihilation. Either way it goes, the enemy and the officers did not get no power over them. Hallelujah. These are the type of things you need to be meditating on because it will take you out of that outrage and that hopelessness. And guess what? The Messiah said that in those days that are to come, that when they deliver us up, he said he will give us a mouth and wisdom that when we speak, we will have that same power that the Messiah had whenever he spoke to those police officers and they fell to the ground. The Messiah said, I will give you a mouth and wisdom that your adversaries will not be able to gainsay nor resist. That's the type of power of word and verbal assault and speaking curses on them that the Messiah is going to give you. He had that same power. Don't be out here scared of no police officers, family. Don't do it. If the most high be with you, who can be against you? That's what you need to be meditating on. Not all this outrage and hopelessness that Negroes is pushing out here. Another thing that folks is outraged about is how our children are being mistreated at school. They pass around all these videos of, uh, pedophiles in the school. They pass around all these videos of these teachers cussing out our children, beating down our children in the schools. Well, guess what you can do instead of having that outrage and hopelessness? Guess what action you can take? Homeschool your children. Simple, simple solution. Instead of being, if, if you really as mad as you trying to make it seem on what the school system is doing to our children, then homeschool your children. Simple solution. But Negroes don't want to do that. They'll come up with every excuse why they can't do it or don't want to do it. But they'd rather sit there and be outraged and feel hopeless about the oppression taking place in the school system instead of homeschooling their children. It's time for solutions and actions, people. I don't want to hear no more outrage and hopelessness. If you ain't taking no action, I'm not trying to hear none of that outrage. I'm not trying to hear none of that hopelessness. If you're not going to take direct action, hallelujah. Listen, let's go to Luke chapter 18, verse one through eight. Just to let you know that I'm in the correct spirit when I share these things. Listen, Luke chapter 18, verse one through eight. And the Messiah spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not the most high, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, avenge me of my adversary. 
Notice that the widow wasn't praying for, uh, you know, everybody to get along and, you know, Jesus loves everybody. She wasn't praying for, you know, the person that was doing her that way to, you know, be given flowers and roses. She said, avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not the most high, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the most high said, hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not the Most High avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Hallelujah. So it is the Father's will to avenge us, brothers and sisters. You are the vengeance of the Most High. Hallelujah. Listen to that. It's beautiful. Another thing that is getting our people all outraged is these stories coming out of the heathens assaulting uh, our people, running up on our women, beating them down. All these news stories coming out of racist heathens, you know, uh, tying nooses up at the job, beating down the brothers and sisters at the job, doing them wrong, such and so forth. Here's the solution, brothers and sisters, so you don't have to sit there and be in outrage and hopeless. Here's the solution to heathens trying to physically assault you. Carry a gun. How about it? Carry weapons. Listen, let's go to Luke chapter 22, verse 35 through 36. And listen to what the Messiah said about self-defense. It says, and he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lack ye anything. And they said nothing. Then he said to them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. Listen to this. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So even the Messiah was a proponent of carrying weapons. So instead of Negroes sitting around being all outraged and hopeless about heathen running up on you and giving you a four piece uh, in your jaw, beating down your women, beating down your children. Instead of being mad about that, get you that pistol license. Go to that shooting range. Practice your shot. And then when a heathen run up, know the laws of your state to where in court it could hold up as self-defense and if need a clip on them, period. That's the solution. Instead of being mad and being a victim, man, they beating us down. They running up on us in the street and beating us up. Bro, you sound like one of these little white kids that be getting bullied at school talking like that. If they run up, they can catch the whole clip righteously hallelujah this is just a this is a different type of mentality and it's going to turn some people off because they don't know the scriptures they don't know the holy spirit they don't know the truth but to those who really connect with the spirit of truth and they understand how the scriptures was written and who the scriptures was written for they're going to be like yeah brother l hallelujah all praise to the father i'm going to defend my family with my life if need be that's going to be the response of the real ones. The fake ones are going to get in that Christianity feeling and say, oh, brother, this ain't right. Blah, 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 blah. Zay. Hey, take it how you want to ignore the scriptures at your own peril. Let's go to Genesis chapter 14, verse 11 through 16. And let's see how father Abraham, who so many people want to claim they follow in his footsteps. Let's see how he handled it whenever the heathens tried to run up on him or his family and physically assault them. Genesis 14, starting at verse 11. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So in other words, Father Abraham, his brother, son, his nephew got kidnapped. Let's see if Father Abraham prayed for him. Let's see if he forgave him. Let's see if he said, Jesus loves you. Uh, everything's OK. Let's just get along. Let's see what he did. It says. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eskol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. Listen to what Abraham did. 
And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318 and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So father Abraham was about defending his people. Hallelujah. I have to say this because there's some people that still do not understand. I'm not saying that we go out and enact physical violence on innocent folks. I'm talking about righteous self defense. I'm talking about being prepared to protect your family, to protect your wives, to protect your children. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. All praise. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11, starting at verse three, verses five and six. And let's see how the two witnesses of Revelation will handle the whole thing of self-defense. Let's see how they're going to respond whenever heathens trying to run up on them and physically assault them. It says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Listen to this. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. Let me read this again because I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly. I just want to make sure that, you know, I thought it was going to say that they prayed for their enemy. I thought it was going to say that they had breakfast, lunch and dinner with the enemy and forgave them, kissed their feet. Uh, let the enemy piss in their face. Let the enemy rape their daughter. I, I just got to make I got to read this again just to make sure I'm not missing those verses. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Hey, it's right there in the print. Go check it out for yourself. Now, another thing that's making folks outraged these days is just the mockery of the oppressor, how the oppressor mocks our people, scoffs our people laughs at our people whenever they see our people in pain protesting outraged they see our people hopeless they laugh at it they feed off of that outrage and that hopelessness but i guarantee they will not have the same response if many of our people start to take on this mentality and this attitude that i'm speaking of today in these scriptures i guarantee you they will laugh no more how do i know Let's go to a story about King David in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 through 19. Here's what it says. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanun, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. So this heathen king... uh. The, the father was somebody that was good to David while he was alive. So David being the upright, noble, righteous man that he is, he wanted to show kindness to this heathen man's son. Let's see if this heathen responded well to the kindness that the brother David was trying to show him. Because I'm going to show you something else about the spirit of many of these people. Even when you show them kindness, many of them are just going to disrespect you even more for your kindness. Yes. Listen to this. It says, and David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon and the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanun, thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he have sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Wherefore Hanun took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks and sent them away. So David was trying to be nice to this heathen. David was trying to be nice to this Gentile, but instead he got repaid with disrespect. And that's the same thing many of them will do today. You can try to be a good Christian. You can try to be nice. You can try to get along with many of them, but all they're going to do is repay you disrespect for your kindness. 
It's the absolute truth. But let's see how David responded. Let's see if he prayed for him. Let's see if he had dinner with him. Let's see if he agreed to disagree. Let's see. It says, and when they told it unto David, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen and of King Makkah, a thousand men and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab. And all the host of the mighty men and the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and of Ishtab and Makkah were by themselves in the field. And when Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too uh, strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our Elohim. And the Most High do that which seemeth him good. And Joab drew nigh and the people that were with him unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before Abishai and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together and Hadarezar sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river. And they came to Helam and Shobak, the captain of the host of Hadarezar, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Halam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen, and smote Shobak, the captain of their host, who died there. And when all the kings that were servants to Hadarezar saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. So the only way that those heathens that mocked David and disrespected him, even though he showed them kindness, the only way that they decided to make peace with David is when they saw that David was ready and willing to take it to the physical violence level. The only way they wanted to make peace and get on good terms is when they saw that David was ready to curse them to their very root. That is the only time that any oppressor is going to stop oppressing you. Bloodshed and curses. You're not going to love your way out of this oppression. You're not going to love your way out of it. You're not going to uh, sit there and be outraged and hopeless and expect that to get you out of it either. It's either direct action or pray curses on them. That's it. Hallelujah. And I'll add another one to that. Wait on the most high. All praise. Because that same David that responded to the Syrians in the way he did, listen to the prayer that he said to pray. Listen to the curses he sent out against the wicked and the enemies. In Psalm chapter 109, it says, Hold not thy peace, O Elohim of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They are spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compass me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries, but I will give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg and let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto to him, neither let there be any favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Most High, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Most High continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. 
As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. Let this be the reward of my adversaries from the Most High and of them that speak evil against my soul. That's why, brothers and sisters, whenever I come across these news stories about these companies doing the blackface and all that, I don't get outraged and hopeless. I simply pray curses that their business would fail. Whenever I come across these stories of these wicked officers that unrighteously and unjustly kill my brothers and sisters, I don't uh, pray for them. I pray curses on them that the father would render to them what they've done. Hallelujah. This is the mentality that we need to begin to get in. We need to have the same mentality of the Messiah. We need to have the same mentality as Moses and Abraham, as Apostle Paul. We need to have the same mentality of the Maccabees boys. We need to understand who the oppressor is, and we need to understand that they will do nothing but feed off your outrage and hopelessness. And then we have to understand that it's Negroes amongst us that also feed off of outrage and hopelessness. These are the type of Negroes that if they live in the days of Exodus, they would want to go right back to Egypt. Those was the Negroes that said, let us appoint us a leader. Let's leave Moses and Aaron and let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to our oppressor. Those type of Negroes is amongst us as well. And they might as well be Gentiles because they are enemies of the most high and enemies of our people as well. And I don't got any time for those type of Negroes either, because those are the type of Negroes that will get you killed and your whole family killed and they'll feel good about it. This is not a game, family. This is the mentality we have to have in these times and in the times that we going into. That's all I got to say about that topic. Don't let these folks feed off your outrage and hopelessness. And don't be that type of Negro that loves your oppression so much that when people oppress you and make you outraged and hopeless, that you just love them even more for treating you like dirt. I pray that you receive these words that have gone forth. I also want to remind the family about the Torah audio book that has been completed. That is available. I'm getting a lot of positive reviews from that. I'm getting brothers and sisters telling me that listening to these laws and commands before they go to sleep. Some brothers and sisters have had sleep problems, insomnia and such and so forth that listening to those laws and commands before they go to sleep has blessed them. I'm getting feedback of brothers and sisters uh, looking forward to the audio book that we will be doing, be it the will of the most high about the words of the most high and the words of the Messiah. I'm just getting a lot of good feedback. So I'm going to put the link for you to download that audio book, the Torah uh, meditation audio book. I'm going to put that in the comment section as well. And in the description box for those who haven't heard about it yet, it is available now. Check it out. Other than that, I look forward to what we got coming up in March. Uh, March 1st to uh, April uh, 20th. Passover is April 19th this year. We're going to be doing 50 ebooks from March 1st to April 19th. Then on April 20th, we're going to do a live stream where I can interact with y'all, you know, face to face, get to know y'all, y'all get to know me. Hallelujah. Also, from March 1st to April 19th, I'm going to be doing uh, 50 scripture discussions every day from March 1st all the way to April 19th. And then we're going to do a live stream on April 20th. So we got a lot of great things coming up with the ministry, with myself. I'm really looking forward to it. So check us out for that. Let's continue to endure on this righteous path and let's win eternal salvation and get our crown. All praise to the Most High and His Son. Shalom.